Hello, beautiful people. It is Matt Nessler here, the third member of the Crease Dive. I am joined by a very, very special guest. We have four-time All-American, two-time National Defensive Player of the Year, one-time National Championship, and the head coach of the Cabrini Cavaliers, Coach Tommy DeLuca. DeLuca, we do uh, we do something easy on this podcast. I just want to ask you, how are you doing today, DeLucas? I'm doing good. Got into uh, work like 30 minutes ago at 1.30 because today was a snow day. So I had the nice morning off, relaxed a little bit, got some work done. Been a good day. I love that. I love that. It's it's game week for the Cavaliers. Um, we're going to be doing something special here at the Crease Dive. Probably going to do bi-weekly, get a, a Cabrini player, Cabrini alumni, Cabrini coach onto the podcast with Nest. Uh, Dukes might pop in and out. And it's just going to be Cabrini everything. A little short episode, uh, go through some stuff from the past, talk about the team this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. Good way for people to stay updated with the season, tune into the guys. And so for everyone out there listening, uh, strap in because this one's going to be all Cabrini. Coach DeLuca, I'm going to get right into it with you and just ask you a real simple, you know, a question you get asked in the real media. How's the transition been for you? coming from a player at a program to becoming an assistant coach to now being left alone as the head coach. We're going to ignore um, the situation with the school for now, but just that transition from player to assistant to head coach. How, uh, how has that been? Yeah. I mean, honestly, the, the transition from assistant to head coach was probably more dramatic than it was from player to assistant, which I don't, I don't think a lot of people would expect that. Um, but honestly, the, it was the guys that made the transition easy from player to coach. Um, you know, like one thing I was worried about was, you know, are they going to see me as a coach or am I still a buddy? And, you know, it's that that weird in between because a lot of those guys I, I am friends with outside of lacrosse. Um, but they all honestly did an, an unbelievable job, yourself included, of, of treating me like a coach, not like a friend. That um that carries me right into my second question here. What was it like coaching me, uh, Matt Nessler? For those who don't know me and DeLuca, we went into Cabrini in the same recruiting class, played four years together. Uh, COVID cut our senior year short in 2020, and I returned in 2022 as a player um, when DeLuca was uh, embarking on his first year as an assistant coach. So, Coach, how was – how was it coaching me? And I, I want you to be honest for everyone, the good, the bad, the ugly, and any sort of stories you might have. Yeah, I mean, it it started off annoying uh, because at first, for those that don't know, Ness was not uh, with us in the fall. So he had the fall off where he was attempting to try to make it as an adult and then joined us in the spring uh, but I fielded quite a lot of phone calls and texts in the fall and I was like, dude, I I don't know, man. Like you gotta call Colf. Like this is, it's not up to me. Like you, you're talking to the wrong guy, and was met with, no, I know, I know, but uh, just what do you think? <laughs> um, and then you know we saw how we did in the alumni game. You know knows how to save the ball, so we we brought him back, um, and then it was good. You know I think again a lot of times I think people might think somebody coaching that somebody that they were buddies with would be you know awkward or difficult. Um, but honestly, I think it makes it easier, right? Because it's, you know, you kind of bridge that gap from player to coach where there might be that disconnect in between. And it's easy to just have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation and just say, hey, like, this is where I'm coming from. Do you agree or disagree? And, you know, if you disagree, why? You know, like, let's talk it out and kind of come to a conclusion. Um, and that's like something I've tried to continue doing, you know, with even the guys that I wasn't as you know, close of off field friends with, or that, you know, are not as close to my age um, as I did with, with Ness, who, like he said, we, we came in literally the, the same recruiting class, um, but it was good. You know, I would say the, the only negative to, to coaching Ness were games that either he didn't play that well or games that we were losing. Um, Cause anyone that knows Matt Nessler, he can be difficult to control at times. So there were some, uh, there were some thrown sticks. There were some choice words said, but you know that that just comes with who you're dealing with sometimes. 
I appreciate you being honest, Coach. Uh, for, from my end, I actually had two guys. Uh, it was Coach DeLuca and another one in our recruiting class, Jake Klein. Uh, DeLuca and Klein were, you know, multiple-time All-Americans, unbelievable players. So to go and be a player for them was a lot of fun. Um, like like DeLuca said, it was it was kind of cool to have a, a relationship off the field where it made it a lot easier to communicate. Um, I think – the respect that DeLuca and Klein got from the players was, was pretty admirable. I, I appreciate all the guys, you know, not treating them like, you know, just one of their buddies. Uh, it was cool to see that line kind of get drawn between player and coach. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll dive into the team a little bit here. How are the boys doing? How's the energy been? Just give us a little peek behind the curtain. How's, uh, how's everything going there down in uh, beautiful Radnor, Pennsylvania? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going well. It's always, it's always just tough to say before like the season really gets going and games get, get started. Um, you know, like there are those days at practice where, you know, you take a step back and you're like, do, do we have the best team in the country? And then there are, there are other days where you're like, Holy shit, we, we might lose every game, you know? So I think just sometimes in practice, it's easy to like nitpick a little bit and like focus too much on stuff. And then games make it a little bit easier. Cause you know, as, as everybody knows, it, it honestly, the X's and O's don't matter as much, right? Like you just go out, you throw the ball out and just the, the better team's going to win or the team that wants it more is going to win. Um, you know, and I, and I think luckily for us, like we are, we're, we're a talented group. We got good players. Um, but even more so, I don't, I don't think that there is a team that wants it more than us, you know, just with everything going on and like the, the buy-in and commitment that this group has had is, is pretty nuts and you know that that's it's bound to pay off at some point so i think we're we're all just ready to get going now we're tired of waiting saturday three o'clock at cabrini you got haverford coming in it's got to feel good that it's game week do you feel you sort of touch a little bit do you feel the difference in the energy and you know the eyes on you from you know not only the cabrini alumni and cabrini players but people outside of cabrini um, and how have you been handling that as a coach? Just sort of a little bit more all eyes on you guys. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hate to say this publicly, but I, it it hasn't really mattered for me. Um, not and not in the sense of like, oh, I'm used to this, or like we're we're too big, we don't care. Um, I just think you know, kind of the, the realistic side of it is that you know, compared to a normal year, I mean, yeah it's it's 10 times bigger than we've ever been talked about there's more people that care about us now um but at the same time like we're still we're still a pretty small fish in a, in a pretty big pond um you know so it's not like espn's here want to talk to me and stuff you know it's yeah. you know o- almost every day there's really no talk of anything and then every so often there's a, a guy with a camera standing over in the corner but you know uh, other than that it's it, it really hasn't been like too overwhelming. Um, you know, I think there's a little bit added pressure, you know, not necessarily because more people are watching or because, you know, social media, whatever. I just think the added pressure comes from that. This is just the last year, you know, and like, you know, I, I've talked to a few people and I think, you know, in, in any organization, any team, you're going to remember usually the first one, the best one and the last one. Right. And you know, I would say, as of right now, the best one was the 2019 team, um, you know, and, and we're just that last team and people are going to remember that, you know, so there's that there's a little bit of that pressure of, you know, how is Cabrini going to be remembered? Right. And, uh, you know, again, of course, people are always going to remember the 2019 season. But if we go out and lose every game this year, well, like a lot of people remember that, too. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's that added pressure of like we want to send this off on a high note and people say, wow, like they, they really had something special there. I love it. I love it. Now we got a couple questions that you're able to pass on. <laughs> no, no pressure to answer. This one is just, uh, are there any teams out there that you tried to schedule that declined to play you? And specifically was one of them Stevenson lacrosse? No, not. Yes. Yes, there are some that declined. Stevenson was not one of them. Um, okay. The it, it's not quite as ex- exciting of a story as I think people might expect it to be or want it to be. Um, but you know, schedules are done like normally a year to a year and a half in advance. Yep. So our schedule was 
almost completely already solidified. Um, and then the kind of small ca caveat to that was Dickinson and Colorado College were both on our schedule. Uh, and then when all of this happened, dropped us, you know, d despite uh, some some arguing for myself and attempting to convince them they were they were not as convinced that we would we would have a team this spring or even if they thought they would i guess they thought we wouldn't be good enough to keep on the schedule so well i'll save you the trouble because i know deluca won't say it uh colorado college didn't want to come back pack out to gabrini uh they take an annual flight out in the tournament get smacked around and get sent home um, I've had more than one occasion where some Colorado kids thought it'd be fun to get a little chirpy and, you know, you're, you're just sending them right back to the airport. So they saved themselves some miles there. I'm sure they'll enjoy a nice vacation somewhere else. Um, as far as Stevenson, I know you said they didn't say no, but I've noticed they fell off Cabrini's schedule, uh, in the last three, four years. And I like to think, uh, you know, our recruiting class and the guys above us, uh, did a pretty good job of shoving it in the Stevenson coach's mouth and uh, having him not want to play us anymore. So that's not coming from the desk of Coach DeLuca. That's coming from the desk of Matt Nessler. I uh, just want to have that on record. Uh, I, I appreciate the disclaimer. And then what is one of your favorite memories as a player outside of winning the national championship? Uh, you've been a player, Lauren. You've been a coach there. Uh, five seasons you played there, including the COVID year. Uh, what was one of your favorite memories as a Cabrini Cab? And we'll, we'll, we'll say except the Natty. So this is – I have two answers for this. I know you said except the Natty, uh, and, I, and I'm not going to say the national championship game, but I, I have told everyone this. Winning the national championship was cool, and, you know, that has to be first place. But I will I will tell anyone that listens a very close second place was the police escort we got on the way to the game. That was probably the coolest thing I've ever been a part of. Um, and I, I will never because so for for those that don't know or haven't haven't been lucky enough to be a part of a national championship, you know, everyone has to go and stay in, in hotels, wherever the venue is, regardless of of how close or far you're from. Right. So for us, we we played in Philly would have been a 30 minute bus drive for us. Um, but we still just for the sake of everyone doing the same thing, had to stay in a hotel in the city. Um, and you know, we get there, whatever, like three days early or whatever it is. And there's like, we have practices, we have team events, events with all the teams in, in the like uh, final four and the national championships. And we had, we had like minor police escorts to all those. We had, you know, cops with us, but yep. Now, we went through some red lights, but it, it was just cool that they were with us. Um, the The morning of the national championship, I I will never forget that. I remember it vividly. You know, we're, we're coming out of the hotel. We're in the lobby just kind of getting ready to go, get on the bus, get over there, and just get this thing done. And, you know, we have what kind of looks like our normal police escort, but a little bit heavier. There's, like, definitely a little bit more guys out there. Um, and we get going and, you know, it, it's nothing that we haven't experienced the past few days. It's, you know, lights and sirens going through red lights. It's all cool stuff. And we get on the highway and sure enough, the two motorcycle cops in front of us just kind of take off. And I remember just looking out the, the front window of the bus, like very disappointed that all we got was to, to the escort to the highway. After that, they were done. Um, and sure enough, those two, those two bikes just went up you know, however many miles up the highway and just made everybody pull over. So we ended up being on the highway as one bus and one bus only. There was not another car around us, just all these people parked on the side of the highway, probably looking at us thinking that we're someone, you know, v a very big deal, not realizing that it was a division three lacrosse team. Uh, but that was, that was by far the coolest part. And then to top that off, like at the very end, pulling into the stadium, we go right past the Jetro lot, and sure enough, that's where, you know, an ocean of fans wearing blue are set up, ready for the game. And, you know, they – I'm getting goosebumps talking about it now. But, You're getting me goosebumps, yeah, Luke. Man, they, uh, you know, they see us coming. They start walking to the front of the lot, and as we turn the turn the bus onto that block, they just all come pouring out of the parking lot, and it was, it was insane. It was, you know, it, it was impossible to lose a game after that. So, so that was definitely a, a close number two behind actually winning the game. Um, 
And then, you know, not that, not that this was like a big deal or anything, but if I had to, if I had to answer that outside of anything national championship related, it would be, it would be genuinely just how much fun that we had. Um, and I was, I was looking at your Snapchat story earlier today and I saw the video of all of us dancing and I was, I was showing my girlfriend, Maddie, and I was just like cracking up, like just every guy in the video is just dancing after a, a home win. Um, and like, that was just our team, just a bunch of guys that were just really close friends trying to have some fun. And then just so happened to be pretty good at cross. That was a, it was a cool experience. I love it. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing I like to, you know, make clear to people that, you know, everyone loves playing sports and everyone loves playing the cross, but as you get older, you know, you're junior, senior in high school, uh, you, you get to college and you start getting those big wins and you're looking around at all your buddies and you're like, we're going to, we're going to have some fun tonight. We, we had a big saying for those 21 plus, uh, you know, earn your beers. And um, it was always fun to go out and earn your beers, whether it was a 15 point win, a one goal win, uh, you know, going out and getting a win over time, you're doing it with the fellows. And then right after, you know, you hit the showers, you grab a cold one, get some food, say hello to your family. And just, it was always a good time. So I, I agree with you hundred percent on that one. It was, it was a special group we had. And I think we were surrounded by a couple special groups, specifically that class above us, you know, the Jordan Krugs and the, the Billy Morgans and, and everyone in that class, you know, sort of took us in. And I think those two classes made a, made it a lot of fun. Uh, I'm, I just I gotta say I'm really glad you didn't include Nick Vass in that. Yes, so Nick Vass technically, uh, as though he is one of the greats, uh, you know, one of my fearless leaders. Uh, him and Nicholas Walgerski famously were not in the class above us. They did a couple extra years before all this COVID stuff. Uh, but a special shout out to Nick Vass and Nicholas Walgerski. Uh, they know they hold a special place in my heart, and uh, I know they hold us. A, a lot of other guys hold them close to their heart. So those guys legends but you know you weren't part of those two special classes it is what it is you just gotta tell the truth sometimes it's, it's the reality yeah. of the situation it really is i got another one that you're able to pass on uh, coming from the nest uh, the desk of matt nestler who was your least favorite team to play or the team you just wanted to beat the most and was it stevenson <sighs> I, don't, I don't know yes and no you know, like, I mean, what we played them, I think, three times yep. right, in, in our career. Um, so, like, it, it was, and, you know, I think Stevenson and Cabrini are, are very similar schools and recruit a similar type of player in some senses. Um, so I think that's kind of a recipe. I don't want to say for a disaster. Sometimes it's a recipe for greatness uh, when those games would happen. Uh, but uh, honestly, like only playing them three times, it's like tough to put them as the team that I wanted to beat the most. Because I know the uh, I know the team you're gonna say is as well as everyone else probably. Does. I, see, I I don't I, I don't know if it's them either. Honestly, uh, for me, this is a, it's a boring answer. But I, I think I think it was any Centennial school. I just think oh, the yeah. uh, the Centennial is hyped up a lot sometimes and. You know, they have a lot of really good teams, but sometimes I think it's a little bit more than they might deserve. Um, so it was always nice to go. And especially considering a lot of a lot of kids at Centennial schools are from this area uh, yeah. and, and in high school would kind of look down at Cabrini and say, you know, I'm not going there. I'm going wherever. And it was always nice saying, well, you could have been here. And now we're going to now we're going to kick your teeth in. I so honestly, th those were my favorite teams play. Yeah, the, the other team I was talking about was Salisbury. Um, you know, they're, they're the, in, in my opinion, the greatest team I've ever played against personally. Um, every year we played them, it was always, you know, arguably the biggest game on our schedule. Uh, we famously, you know, had a huge first ever win against them as a program when we were freshmen on a Friday night, double overtime game, seven freshmen starting, suck at Salisbury. Um, but then they'd always get our number in the tournament. You know, famously, I think, in the three years we played Salisbury in the regular season, whoever won in the regular season uh, ended up losing in the in the playoffs. So we beat them freshman year, and then they got the last laugh winning the Natty. And then when we won the national championship, they actually smacked us around in the regular season. And then we were lucky enough to get that last laugh in the uh, in the semifinals. So, you know, I, I I hate Stevenson more than anything in the world. Uh, 
I also hate Salisbury. I don't hate Salisbury the way I hate Stevenson. I think Salisbury sort of earned like a level of respect, uh, more Raven Steelers ish. Whereas uh, I look at Stevenson more Steelers Bengals, where like we're kind of their dad now. Um, you know, anyone who went to Stevenson, uh, you know my Instagram. Come and find me. I don't like you. Uh, besides some of the goalies there, some good guys there, some good goalies went there. Um, the rest of you, I hate all of you and your head coach. But Salisbury's different. They're 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 a team that comes in really prepared. They're a team that we always had to be really prepared for. And when we got to Cabrini, we'd never beaten them. So to be part of that first team to beat them and then to beat them again when we won the national championship was always super cool. Um, but mine mine is obviously those two teams, and I'm not not shy to say that. Yeah, and I and I think for me, like Salisbury's, it, it's tough to say them as an answer to that question because, you know, when when we would play Stevenson, it was it was always a great game, but it, it was it was the antics during the game that made it great. Um, and like Salis, I mean, obviously Salisbury's head coach has been there far longer than either of us have been alive, yeah. and has done unbelievable things there. Um, you know, but they, they just have kind of that level of respect that not only obviously they've earned, but that they give, you know, to whoever they're playing. Um, and, and it's tough to say that, you know, they're the most hated team just cause they happen to be very good. You yeah. know, like I, I'd much rather hate a team for, for thinking they're good or for, you know, being a, a bunch of assholes rather than just being very good at lacrosse. A hundred, a hundred percent agree. Um, I got one more, or I have a few more, uh, but one more you're able to pass on if you don't want to commit. Am I able to get a verbal commitment from you, Tommy DeLuca? This is legally binding, uh, that you'll be playing with the Pleasants at War at the Shore last weekend of July, summer of 2024. For any future employers of yours, this will be held um, as a, you know, just a legal binding contract, whatever you want to say it. I'm there's a reason I'm doing a lacrosse podcast. I don't know how the legality of any of this works, but wherever you end up after Cabrini, uh, you just need to show them this video and you'll have that weekend off from recruiting. Uh, so I just want to know if I'm able to get a verbal commitment from you, nothing on pen and paper yet. Yeah. I, I knew that you were going to ask that and try to put me on the spot for, I'm sure everybody is well aware of the situation that Cabrini is in. And I have told Ness that it is tough to commit to Ooh. things over the summer when I, when I have literally no idea what, what my future looks like, and what my next job will be. Um, I will say for the sake of the pod, I will give you a verbal commitment that I will play. Uh, it, I was down with the guys the first time this past summer after saying, after saying no way too many times. And it was, you know, of course, an incredible time being with the boys. So I will verbal commit. Yes. But today is not national signing day. So I have time to flip. Understood. Just uh, as well as, you know, um, you know, we've been buddies for a long time and you mentioned coming down for the first time last summer, we had a lot of fun. Uh, just keep in mind, if you change that commitment, um, you know, there were a lot of people there and uh, a lot of guys that could, you know, whether we spread rumors that are true or not, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, we're a powerful summer team, and uh, you bail on us, like we won't hesitate to cancel your ass. Yeah, um, I mean, just, um, on, on the <laughs> on the flip side of that, maybe you guys could band together and keep our school open. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, that's not going to happen. That actually takes me right into our next question. Do you think Cabrini should be criminally investigated for the mismanagement of our money and fucking over thousands of alums as well as current students and athletes? You yeah, can. I mean, this this is one that that would be easier to pass on. Um, I don't I don't even know who would be investigated, uh, but I, I I think there there were some decisions that were were not great ones, uh, but. You know, it is what it is at this point, and sometimes it happens. So here we are. That's a, it's an honorable answer. Uh, you know, Cabrini employee Tommy DeLuca, uh, I'd love to ask him that question again in the summer. I agree with him, though. It's hard to pinpoint who would be investigated. I just uh, – a firm believer, and, you know, there's a lot of millions of dollars that school was in debt. Um, I believe it was close to 45 to $50 million. I could be pulling those numbers – straight out of my ass but 
Um, when something like that happens, it just it just opens your eyes a little bit. So it's an interesting dynamic there. We got uh, we got a few more minutes left here before I ask you some some final questions. Do you have anything you want to ask ask uh, <laughs> myself, Matt Nessler, whether it be about life, our time together, the super dope lacrosse podcast that we get to be on together, um, whatever it may be. And if you if you don't have anything, I'll rattle off a few more questions before we before we split here. I one question I have is you're how old? 26? 26. 26. Do you do you think that you will be able to maintain this lifestyle of I don't even know if you have a job, but I'm I'm banking on the fact that you do because you need money, but having whatever job you have that allows you to have people like me on a podcast and go watch lacrosse games and talk about them. Do you think that is sustainable? Sustainable strictly in the lacrosse world is going to be tough. Um, I do have a job uh, slash did have a job for anyone out there. I'm looking, I'm available. Um, Luckily doing stuff like this um, with the way work from home works, I'm able to make time. Um, being in between jobs right now makes it a little easier to hop on at two o'clock with you in the middle of the day. Um, but Dukes and uh, Jordy both, you know, work, you know, full-time gigs outside of this. And I kind of look at them as, you know, whatever they're doing, I'm going to try to do the same. Uh, you know, Jordy's married with a family. He's doing great. Um, and he just sort of makes time for it. It's, it's a, it's a side gig that, that takes up some time, but it's not a, a side gig that requires, you know, you know, six, seven hours a day, of you know planning and doing stuff like that so i think it's sustainable i don't think it's sustainable to be my only job per se um but it's been a lot of fun i'm really lucky to to get into the lacrosse world and get it be able to do this stuff i've always said i'm very thankful for dukes and jordy for just allowing me to come on <clears throat> i always told them whatever you need me to do i'll do it and if i'm ever doing too much just tell me and they've sort of just given me the leash and let me run um so it's I, I'm lucky to be able to do fun stuff like this. I get to do some stuff for the professional lacrosse league as well as I'm going to focus a lot on Cabrini and you know cover the Division One and some of Division Three. Um, but sustainable? No, it's tough. You know how it is. The lacrosse world just doesn't have a lot of money behind it. Um, even big time lacrosse schools they're not they're not doing backflips and cash like these like these big time football and you know big time whatever you know soccer baseball whatever these colleges are making money off of. It's mostly football. But lacrosse is certainly not one of those that's going to drive in a lot of money. Um, the professional league's been booming. I'd love to do more for the PLL. Um, it's really cool to see them grow. I think the younger generations like really bought into the professional lacrosse league, which is cool. These like elementary school and middle school kids, they absolutely love it, and super cool just to see them, you know, kind of latching onto the game. Because when we were growing up, the major league lacrosse just just didn't have that same kind of feel to it. Social media wasn't around, and I got to give my my hat like a Brady signed hat uh, to the PLL for doing a great job there. It opens doors for, for guys like me who, who want to stay in the media landscape and do content. And I love lacrosse. Everyone knows deep down inside my favorite sports football, uh, you know, the highlight tapes out there, Matt Nessler huddle. Don't be scared to, don't be scared to watch it. Um, I watch it at least once a week, but lacrosse has always been really special to me. When you play something for 16, 17 years, it's cool to, to stay involved. And I get to talk to you Deluxe and to sit, sit down have, my national championship flag with the real national championship trophy sitting behind you. It's uh it's pretty cool. Sustainable. No fun. Yes. Looking for yeah, it. I mean, I think, I think like with, you know, all the things you said about football and how, you know, obviously like the, the money that's to be made in college and pro football is like astronomically different than college and pro lacrosse. Uh, but like the flip side of that is, you know, someone, someone like you, could never really get their foot in the door in the NFL doing something as simple as this, right? And like just talking to random guys or just talking about the game. Uh, and like the one of the best parts about lacrosse is it's relatively speaking, just such a small and tight knit community that like if you, even if you don't know the right people, if you're just, you know, doing the right things and say the right things a few times, like chances are you'll kind of, you'll get a decent platform and, you know, you'll get the, your foot in the door of places that like you probably couldn't get in just about any other sport, you know? So like, that's the, that's the cool side of it, I guess. Uh, I do also want to circle back 
Uh, in answering that question, you mentioned Jordy's uh, wife and kids. Are you are you letting the podcast know first that marriage and kids are are soon on the table for you? Is that a <laughs> is that breaking news? Not breaking news. Um, you know, Deluca mentioned his girlfriend earlier. I also have a girlfriend. Shout out my girlfriend Amory. Um, you know, humble brag. Three years in March, there will be uh, no marriage or kids in the in the near future. But uh, like me and Dukes, Dukes and I have said, it's cool to know that there's someone out there who has a real family and does a lacrosse podcast. Um, it makes our goals in life a little more tangible, um, you know, outside of the working world. So shout out Jordy for that. Um, and to answer DeLuca's question, no. <laughs> but if DeLuca has any more questions, I got three more fun, quick questions. And then um, I think we're going to cut this off. We're trying to keep these episodes a little shorter than the regular crease dive episodes. And for you Cabrini sickos and you lax rats, this will be, you know, two times a week of us just chopping it up. So if you don't have anything else for me to lose, I got three last quick ones for you. I got one more. You can answer it now. We can do this at the end. Hit who is me. your, who is your early prediction for national championship matchup this year? We'll say for, we'll say for D one only. Okay. So division one, I think, uh, my heart and my 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 gut are telling me, you know, stick with C.J. Curse and the Cornell boys. I think C.J. Curse is is. I hate to say it, and Colin's never going to tell me I'm wrong. None of them will, but I think he might be the most talented Cursed. Um, he's unbelievable. I think the way he plays the game is just like so much fun to watch, and his teammates love him. I'd love to see Cornell make a run, and I think Cornell seeing Virginia would be awesome. Um, but it's hard to just, you know, ignore Duke, who is an absolute wagon. But for me going on the record, I'm going to go Virginia versus Cornell. I just want everyone out there listening know that uh, – want them to know that, you know, I'm not blind and stupid, and I know that there's a lot of really good teams out there. Um, but I ride with my guys. So I'm going to stick with CJ Kirst, Kirst of the week to the moon. Um, those guys have done a lot for me, and they've accepted me with open arms into their very, very big lacrosse family. I've known them since I was little. So we'll go on the record, Cornell versus Virginia. What about you, Deluxe? You got a Division One pick? Yeah, I mean, this is such a shitty answer, but I think a rematch of last year. I, mean, okay. I think Duke and Notre Dame are both just incredible. I thought the game last year was sick. Um, it would be – Awesome to see those two go at it again. Obviously, they will in the regular season, but you know, to meet in the national championship would be awesome. Uh, so I'm going to say those two, and I think Duke over ND this year. Shout out, uh, Chris Conlin, Chatham graduate, part of the 2016 state championship team. Actually, went back to Notre Dame this spring. Similar situation to sort of what I did with Cabrini. He was, you know, working full time job. And you know, the door open for him to come back, and now he's back playing the cross. I also want to apologize to the, the Fighting Irish for not giving you a look in that little question because uh, I told him and the guys, you know, I'll be watching them, and I think that that team's really special. So, so if I'm wrong, I'm hoping Notre Dame's in there. Um, I'm going to bang out these three questions for you real quick. Um, do you think you have more career ground balls than I do Fortnite wins? I know the answer. That's a that's a really really good question. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I'll, I'll bet on myself. I'll say yes. I I have more. Uh, you got absolutely demolished. Uh, Seven hundred and forty five Fortnite wins for Nest. Just an absolute. I'm a team. I'm a teammate's teammate. I hop on there four guys and we grind out wins. Uh, Deluca, the exact number. I think you were uh, three hundred and you know. I don't have you. I believe it was 380, 350, somewhere in there. If you know it, you're more than welcome to say it. But no. speaking of ground balls, there's rumors swirling that in 2017, Cabrini goalie Matt Nessler had more ground balls than you did. Um, is that true? And after you answer, if it's true, uh, we're going to cut your mic. So just is that true, yes or no? I, I would have to go uh, to the stat book. I don't know if you get uh, a ground ball for just making a save. I think that might be the case. Um, so good for you. Um, and, again, I don't know if this is also in the stat book, but 2017 Cabrini goalie Matt Nessler 
uh, almost lost the game that he referenced to earlier when we beat the Salisbury team for the first time ever. Uh, so that almost wasn't a talking point when he almost lost us the game, but uh, luckily the nine guys in front of him stepped up quite a bit. Wow. I mean, it's one thing to blame your goalie. It's another thing just to come out, you know, <laughs> seven years later and blame your goalie. Uh, that hurts. But for those listening, I a hundred percent basically tried to do everything in my power to blow that game. I had the ball 30 seconds left up by one. I tried to, I tried to make a move on a guy probably should have just chucked it. That guy bitch made me. I dropped the ball. He picked it up and put it right into the empty net. And we're talking about a Salisbury team that I believe was on a 42 game winning streak coming off. Uh, they, they had uh, lost a year prior, won a nat- then went undefeated, won a national championship. And then we're towards the end of the season this year. Um, but you know, I'm not, I, I'll always toot my own horn. I had a big save in OT. I, get the I, out. I was going to say, I was going to say, you did. You came up big in OT, made a save. And so. then uh, Jay Klein, who I mentioned earlier, freshman, scores the game winner uh, on Salisbury's head. So that felt good. That was our first taste of, of, you know, this team can really do it. And I think that game, being two years prior to the national championship, still played a pretty pivotal role in us being like, we, we can hang with anyone and we can beat anyone. I think – that is it for me. That was a, I got that was a great question. question, by the way. Thank you, thank you. I got. One I should. I, I mean, I you got to you got to bet on yourself, but I absolutely should have known that you would have blown me out of the water. Yeah, for the, I was putting in a lot more Fortnite hours than school yeah. lacrosse hours, and that's not a shot at school or lacrosse. It's just when I wasn't doing either of those two things, I was I was on the sticks. Shout out Mount Pleas. Shout out the fellas. Uh, shout out all the people I played Fortnite with. Fortnite rules. Um, but so from the desk of Dukes, he just wanted to know if you could send your kids to one program next year, your, your players, where would you send them? It could be anywhere. It could be a certain reason, but just if you to group a few of them together and send them off to a school that you'd vouch for, where would it be? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is honestly a tough one because, uh, I don't want to screw myself over when I have to look for a new job. Uh, and I, that. I leave some schools off. I will take the very easy, politically correct answer uh, and not say wherever they'll be happiest. I don't care about that. I will say <laughs> where, wherever I end up, I hope that is where all the guys go. And we just make that Cabrini 2.0. I love it. That'd be a dream come true. I would become a super fan uh, if Coach DeLuca were to leave Cabrini because there is no more Cabrini and then he just brings everyone with him. It would be it might even be a better story than this season. So yeah. that's from the desk of Dukes. Another great question. Dukes, uh, you know, he, he's watching. He's going to be boots on the ground with me for the Salisbury game. We're going to try to make some good content there. And uh, he agreed, you know, if you guys are able to stick it to him, we will be storming the field as a unit, Dukes uh-huh. and I, which will be fun. But um, just any parting message heading into the season for the fans, alumni, you know, current players, anything you want to say when you sign off here? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I I sent out an email to all of our alumni earlier this week, but you know, just a huge thank you to to those guys, to those families, and you know, supporters throughout the years that you know have not only always been there for for us and for Cabrini Lacrosse, uh, but especially this year to kind of just band together and say, yeah, I know this sick situation sucks, but we don't care and. As long as, as long as you guys have a team, we'll, we'll be there cheering for you guys. So, um, you know, just thank you again to, to all those guys, including you, Ness. You're, you're a huge part of that. I appreciate the Luke's, uh, before we head out that national championship trophy behind you, where's that head? And when the, when the school closes their doors, is that coming home with coach DeLuca? Yeah, I don't know. I had one player in mind who I think besides yourself probably deserves to have it in their house. And I'm just going to go on the record and say, that's Jordan Krug. Um, not only was he a phenomenal lacrosse player, his family quite literally bled uh, Cabrini Blue. You know, Mr. Krug, just an absolute staple in the Cabrini lacrosse community. Uh, whether it's getting the families rowdy before the games, being at every game, or or getting the fellows refreshed afterwards, he's a, he's a special guy. So if you don't take it home, DeLuca, and Krug doesn't take it home, then I, I'll, I'll take that shit from both you guys for sure. Um, anyone else listening? Uh, we're stealing everything from Cabrini after the last game. So uh, we'll meet there. But I just want to thank you for coming on, DeLuca. I'm really excited to you know, give you guys a little more spotlight on the podcast, do an episode bi-weekly, and uh, 
it's going to be a lot of fun. I'll, I'll be seeing you this Saturday. If you, if you can't find me, just double check your office. I might be sitting there having a cold one. Yeah, I'm so glad that it has a lock on the door. <laughs> Cole, Cole for left his key once. I still got it. So <laughs> unless you change those locks, I wouldn't be too sure about that. And I, and I won't hesitate to go through the window. I, well, I, the good news is I trust you to sit in here. So you're more than welcome. My home is your home. I appreciate DeLuca. Good luck this weekend. Thanks for coming on. And like my buddy Jordy says, we'll be keeping it low to high till the day we die. Thank you.